when your body is shifting over to burning fat as a fuel source, it doesn't feel very pleasant. Now, there's things you can do to make that a little bit easier. One of the things is just be really patient with it. Um, they have shown um, that athletes in particular, it can take a good three, four months to kind of really get conditioned to burn fat. Um, but once you do, it's really quite amazing the things that you can do. If you've been watching, you know that I take my ingredients very seriously, but there are three companies that I have found that I absolutely love. Check the description for discount codes. Hello, my name is Adrian. This is a series where I interview different people who've inspired me today. I have Casey. He's a certified nutrition coach, a certified personal trainer, and a certified carnivore coach, and a world famous podcaster. Thank you for being here, Casey. Uh, it's such an honor to join you. I think the world famous part is a little bit debatable, but the other stuff is true. And it's an honor to be here with you. I, I loved hearing your story on my show. And um, I know we're going to get a lot of people listening to that. And um, yeah, it's an honor to be here. Well, Casey is one of the people I've watched from the very beginning. Uh, somehow I stumbled upon his podcast right away. And he he interviews fabulous people, everyone from James the Carnivorous to all the good people. So anyway, could you tell us, Casey, how did you come to carnivore? Yeah, um, I mean, just depends on how far back you want to go. The most relevant uh, part was, you know, me, I was I was studying to be an architect in college. I ended up joining a gym where I could train in the off season for cycling and and being in this gym and watching uh, the personal trainers train their clients and use uh, things like heart rate monitors, I thought looked really fun and engaging. And I didn't know that that's what I wanted to do for my career, but at least for a job that I could do temporarily, it looked really interesting. So I ended up asking the manager what I needed to do to get certified and get a job there. And he told me what certification to get. And I hit the books and got that. And uh, that was March of 2007. So I've been doing this now for uh, 17 years. Um, initially, what, what kind of... Um, drew me into learning about metabolism and eventually like low carbohydrate metabolism was my work using metabolic hearts where we would measure something called metabolic rate in people um if if, if your audience is familiar with like a vo2 max test where somebody gets on a bike or a treadmill and they start out really easy and they ramp up and go harder and harder and harder until they want to stop uh, that basically tells people what their vo2 max is so that's a nice marker for like cardiovascular fitness for people who are training for endurance type events which I was at the time, um, but also um, the the other the other aspects that we could measure was your your baseline or what we call your resting metabolic rate or your basal metabolic rate, which means you might come in and just lay down on a comfortable seat, and I would uh, put a mask on you that would collect your respirations, and that would tell me how many calories your body would burn at a baseline, but also would take it one step further to tell us where those calories were coming from, as far as what fuel source um, are you burning? Are you burning more of your calories from fat, which is what most of us want, versus are you burning more of your calories from carbohydrates? So um, that was really interesting as far as like in the beginning, what we learned about people who were doing really restrictive diets, especially when they were pairing it up with uh, doing a lot of activity, is that you would um, suppress or lower your metabolic rate over time. And we got better and better at seeing that over time. In fact, um, you'll really appreciate this. I got to interview a woman who was on the Biggest Loser contestant after she had got kicked off. Um, and she told us the stories about doing, you know, six hours a day of workouts and they had really controlled um, diets at that point, eating 1200 calories. This is back in probably 2010, 2011. And based on a, a basic kind of averaging calculation, we, we calculated that her baseline resting metabolic rate should be about 2000 calories and it ended up being about half of that. Um, and that's relevant for most people because that is the number of, of, that's the amount of energy that you're using in a day. And so if you're doing something that's literally teaching you to burn less and less and less and less calories over time, and if you're not teaching your body to increase its burning of fat and decrease the amount of carbohydrates that it's burning, you're going to have people doing these diet plans and these workout plans that are going to end up plateauing and are going to be, make people be very, very hungry. And that's going to cause people to gain tremendous amounts of weights when they stop, which they will because you can't sustain that. Um, and yeah, willpower only goes so far and people get really hungry and lots of cravings, like I said. And so people end up gaining the weight back without even realizing that what caused the weight gain was what they did to lose weight to begin with. It's such a trap. It's it's so unfortunate. So um, 
you know, that was using that as a tool was really interesting to try to, um, you know, manipulate people's metabolic rates, how to teach them how to burn more calories and also how to burn more fat. Um, it was also relevant for people like myself who are endurance athletes because endurance athletes um, will be using a mixture of energy depending on how hard they're pushing themselves, but they normally go for a very long time. So if you imagine, you know, you're, you're a, in a, in a, an intensity range where your body's burning a tremendous amount of sugar and your body can only store such a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of sugar in the body that runs out eventually. And that's what people describe as like bonking or they hit the wall. And I think most of the listeners know if they, you know, do a run or ride or something where they go too hard for too long and they all of a sudden run out of energy. That's simply the body just running out of uh, the carbohydrate stores that it has and it's got no more fuel. So, if you can teach an endurance athlete to burn a higher percentage of fat and a lower percentage of carbohydrate, you can really reduce or eliminate that problem because the fat that you store, you've got tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of calories from fat on the body that it can use. It's just a matter of whether you're using that as a fuel source or not. So we learned that you could manipulate that through training, but we learned that you can also manipulate that much more powerfully with diet. So that required a reduction in carbohydrate and increase in dietary fat, which then led me to take a look at you know low carbohydrate diets to then learn about what a ketogenic diet was um, and eventually if you're in that space and learning about that kind of thing for long enough you start to hear about this strange subset of these low carb people who decide to take it even further uh, and they go carnivore and all they're doing is eating meat and it's the craziest thing when you first hear about it i remember when i listened to joe rogan uh, and sean baker was hosted on a show back in i don't know 2017 2018 and hearing about this doctor who's in his mid-50s and he's crushing deadlifts and rowing competitions and he's only eating steak and he doesn't really do a lot of blood labs because he feels really good and I, it was all just the strangest thing i'd ever heard of in fact i turned that episode off midway through um and and didn't go back and listen to it until like last year, even though I had been certified through his company for several years now. Uh, I thought it was ridiculous. Um, but after listening to enough people, um, I decided to give it a try for 30 days. That was in April of 2019 at, you know, the, the end of the month when the first day of May started. I had been feeling so great and didn't miss any of the stuff that I cut out. So I decided to just continue. And that's, again, been five, five and a half years that I've been, you know, pretty I'd say more kind of strict carnivore. I can definitely tolerate a few things here and there, but for the most part, um, a, a vast majority of my calories come from animal products. So that's kind of how I got into all of that. And yeah, quite healthy, happy at age 40, feeling much better than I did at age 30 and have really good energy and, and feel great. So no, no intention of stopping. When's your birthday? Uh, my birthday is January 13th. Okay. March 14th, 40. That's a good year. Nice. 40 is a good year. Are you enjoying it so far? It I think it's great. I think it's the best ever. I, I feel like you, I feel better at 40 than I did at 25. Honest to God, yeah. feel yeah, better at 40 too. than I did at 22 because I was eating all these foods and thought that I was being healthy and I was struggling. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting. You talk about the athlete thing because I have a lot of friends who are athletes. And when you go to these races, you'll see like every four miles, they'll have little aid stations with sugar. And you're like, if you've been training for two years or six months, however long you've been training and you need a bump every couple of miles, what's going on? You've been training. And you were talking about that, that switch where the, the sugar burns out and you feel like crud as you switch into the fat burning, that, that transition feels terrible, right? Yeah. It does, and it should. Um, the way I describe it is like, imagine taking a trip to Bali, right? Like to go to Bali is actually quite unpleasant. It's probably like three different transfers on different planes and layovers and in lines with a bunch of sweaty people and they, they, they stink. You get on a bus and have to ride a bus. Like to, to get to Bali, like really kind of sucks. Now, once you're there, it's quite awesome. It's just the traveling to get there is not very fun. A lot of people would say, yeah, it's totally worth it when you get there. And if you could stay there as long as you wanted once you got there, like it would be totally worth the travel. And it's kind of like that when your body is shifting over to burning fat as a fuel source, it doesn't feel very pleasant. Now there's things you can do to make that a little bit easier. One of the things is just be really patient with it. Um, they have shown um, that athletes in particular, it can take a good three, four months to kind of really get conditioned to burn fat. Um, but once you do, it's really quite amazing the things that you can do. Um, 
Um, for example, like today, um, you know, between seeing all my clients that I've already seen today, I've already walked uh, about four or five miles based on the steps that I've done just in my neighborhood. Um, I'm going to go play a nice hockey game after this. That's quite intense for about an hour and a half. And that's a really kind of high heart rate, you know, interval type training. Um, I'm doing all of that in the fasted state. I don't experience any hunger right now. Um, I'm going to be fasted when I play a hockey game and it's going to feel great and I'm not worried about it. Uh, if I go on a longer bike ride, like Saturday, I went on a 50 mile bike ride and I didn't bring anything as far as like calories with me, just some electrolytes. And yeah, if you're, if your body is using sugar, you need those rest stations because you're burning sugar at such a rate and it's such a finite, tiny amount of fuel that you can carry. Your only other option is to be refueling that constantly, which I mean, you know what it's like to be consuming a lot of that high sugary product. It just gets in your stomach. It doesn't sit very well. Um, when I was competitive with cycling, that's all I did. That's all anybody told us. And so you're just battling, like feeling terrible and your stomach hurts and your body's trying to decide, am I using blood for, you know, the exercise or am I trying to digest food right now? And, and you needed to do that because otherwise you would be completely out of energy at a certain point. So learning how to be a better fat burner is so beneficial for all of us, regardless of whether you want to be an athlete or whether you just want to lose fat or whether you want to have like really good energy. That's why we store fat on our body. Body, it's to be used and burned. And if you can keep your carbohydrates down long enough, your body will do that quite perfectly well. So, yeah, I've been walking half marathons. I gave up running and I don't bring anything with me except a small bottle of water. And as long as it's not super hot out, that's, that's all I need is just one bottle of water. And I never feel like crud the whole time. And it's such a change versus before I was making these fancy carb balls. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Absolutely. Like the sugar balls. Yep. And, and, and you, and you want to make sure to get all your organic ingredients and mix them all together and put them in containers and keep them with you. And then you got to stop along the way and grab stuff out of your bag, or you got to eat the processed products, which can't, I can't imagine anybody's thinking this is great. Here's the next thing though. If we're refueling with sugar constantly, are we working towards any fat loss at all? That's a great question. Um, it's a really great question. Some people would argue that, you know, fueling with carbohydrate and then exercising and exercise burns, you know, a certain percentage of fat versus carbohydrate. Uh, would you be able to lose weight like that? I think you could lose some, but uh, again, I, I, what I know and what you know is like, it's not necessarily about weight loss. People don't want to just lose weight. They want to lose fat. You want to do the mm -hmm. best you can to get the fat off, but also preserve your lean mass, your bone density. You don't want any of that to go down. And most diets we know, or weight loss drugs, we're hearing a lot about, you know, Ozempic and some of these other drugs that are making people lose tremendous amounts of lean mass. Um, we, we People are talking about Ozempic face where their face is kind of sagging. And most diets do the same thing where, yeah, you lose some fat, but you also lose, you know, water, you lose muscle, you lose other lean tissue. Um, and I found this way of eating, um, you know, when you're eating adequate amounts of protein and fat to kind of fill the rest of the calories and you're keeping your carbohydrates very low, your body again just switches over to the more efficient fuel source, which is fat, and it can burn it very, very well. And, you know, years and years of doing this and helping people um, transition over to this diet and using body fat scales in particular to show like, what is your fat mass? What is your lean mass? And just, I, I never see anybody doing this and not losing fat and not preserving their lean mass. It happens for everybody. I can't see anybody really that hasn't like succeeded in maintaining that lean mass. So um, it's a great way to go. It's a great way to live. And um, yeah, I think you'd be much better served most people by changing the food that they eat over to those fats and proteins so that your body is more trained to use that as a fuel source and then reduce its own body fat. So I had heard somebody say something like muscle conversion into energy only takes minutes, but, but fat conversion takes like 12 hours. So if people are consuming carbohydrates and running and the carbohydrates run out, are they potentially burning up their muscle? I love this question. This is a very, very insightful question. Um, and I, I love that you're asking it. Um, we hear about the term gluconeogenesis. Uh, so let's break that down. Gluco, glucose. Neo means new. Genesis means creation. So creating new glucose is essentially what that word means. Now, this is very contextual in the way that your body will run this system. You need carbohydrates, regardless of whether you eat them or not. They are necessary inside the body. They 
are not necessary for us to consume, but they are necessary for a certain percentage of the brain. Red blood cells need them, parts of the kidney. There's certain tissues in the body that do need glucose, which is why even if you do a strict carnivore diet, your blood sugar always remains about the same. It's still about 70, 80, maybe 90 for some people. Um, there's still sugar in your blood and people might think like, well, where is that coming from if I'm not eating any? We go back to that gluconeogenesis. Your body's always creating the perfect amount. So let's take, like I said, this is contextual. So let's take the athlete who is a sugar burner. They're running, let's say they're doing an intensity where they're burning a thousand calories an hour. And let's say like 80 or 90% of those calories are coming from sugar. Most people, uh, depending on muscle mass, so this number can be a little bit different whether you're a man or a woman based on muscle mass, the number of sugar calories that you have in your body, max, like best case scenario, for most women is probably going to be around 1,500. For most men, it's going to be around 2,000. Again, that's best case scenario. It's assuming that you haven't lowered that whatsoever. So if you start to think about the math, okay, well, if I'm running for three hours, I'm burning a thousand calories, 80% of it's coming from carbohydrates. You might be burning 800 calories of sugar every single hour. Well, you're not going to be able to get past that two and a half hour mark without bonking because your body is going to run out of that fuel. And so in that state, when the body is looking for more glucose, it's looking for any kind of um, substrate to break it down, to get that sugar that it's needing to work at that intensity. Yes, the protein that you have in your body, a large part of that is in muscle mass. It's in other places too, but it's a large part of muscle mass. Since you need so much more carbohydrate, your body needs so much more of the gluconeogenesis that I think you're a much higher risk of, of burning muscle mass, which again is what people don't want to do. Now, if we flip that and we say that, okay, now we've got an athlete who's a fat burner, they're burning the same number of calories, but they've conditioned themselves to burn 80% of their calories from fat. Now they're only burning 20% of their calories from carbohydrates. Even they're burning the same amount of calories, only 200 of those calories are coming from carbohydrate. Again, if you're storing 1500 or 2000, well, that person's going to be able to go far longer, many, many, many more hours because they got the fat storage, they're preserving the sugar storage. And if you do get to that point where that's out, the level of gluconeogenesis that you need is so much lower because your body's burning so much more of the fat. So it's way less likely that you see people actually burning up muscle tissue. And I, I, Adrian, I'm telling you, like I said, I use a body fat scale all the time. I've got a portable one that's quite accurate. People use it and track it with intervals. And if people are doing any kind of low carbohydrate, ketogenic, carnivore, maybe they're incorporating fasting, I never see their muscle mass drop. I never see it. If they can maintain so easily their muscle mass and never drops out, even if you might think like, wow, maybe this person's only eating once a day. How are they getting enough protein? I don't see that the extra protein that somebody needs is coming from muscle tissue itself. You can really, really preserve it. So like I said, it was a really, really insightful question. And it's all very contextual on what fuel source you're, you're more used to burning. This is a little bit of a switch, sort of, but people talk about, they've asked me because I used to have chronic hypoglycemia and they said, when you eat all this protein, why are, are you now having the same blood sugar issues? And I'm not. Can you explain that? That's a great question. Again, I think the same context of somebody who's using carbohydrates as their fuel source is going to be very hungry. They're going to need to eat and snack and eat and snack several times a day, regardless of how much protein they're getting. And so you're getting such wild up and down and up and down blood sugar numbers. Um, insulin is the hormone that we release to store energy inside the body and, and stuff, you know, especially excess sugar into fat cells when we don't have any more room to store that, that very small finite amount of fuel that we're taking in. And it's so, it's so good at what it does that it can, it can oftentimes take too much sugar out of the blood. And that's where the blood sugar drops below where it should be. And now we get hypoglycemia symptoms where you feel shaky, you feel that hunger and those cravings. And like, it's not a great place to be. And your body is just desperate for energy and it doesn't know where to get it because insulin is suppressing the burning of fuels, but it took too much sugar out of the blood. Um, and, and, you know, the sugar really can't stay in the blood past a certain amount. And so in that state with those constant swings, it's pretty tough. Now, when your body is burning fat, fat is such a more efficient fuel source. It's almost like thinking about a fire that is run on logs versus a fire that's run on kindling. 
the carbohydrate fuel source kind of works like kindling where it's like you get some flame and it shoots up and makes a big fire but it dies quickly it puts out a lot of pollution um, you have to be constantly trying to feed that fire if you want to keep it going with more and more kindling whatever you have where a fat burning person their fire is going to be much more like a log where you can set a log in it it burns very cleanly and efficiently for a very very long time you can go do other stuff and your fire is going to be fine for quite a while that's kind of how those two things are different so i think if you're starting with a much more stable blood sugar platform where the body is using gluconeogenesis at a very low level to just give you the, the exact right amount of sugar that you need um, all the time, you won't necessarily have those same swings and up and down and up and down in blood sugar. And again, I, I would I would argue that, you know, me heading out to play this hockey game later on today is a good example of that. I'm going to have my intensity be very, very high at a heart rate where I would be burning, you know, a, some percentage of carbohydrate, um, but I don't need to eat carbohydrate and they're not going to bonk during an hour and a half intense kind of skate because my body's just making the exact right amount and when i finish i'm not hungry i don't feel like i had that blood sugar crash same as you like you don't you don't get those anymore because the body is just regulating itself perfectly for what you need in that moment it's really quite a clever system and it's just it's such a bummer that it's not even like if carbohydrate if we had carbohydrates available the way they are in nature none of this would be a problem for anybody and we could all live very healthy because it's like you know it's at the time of this recording the middle of july i could walk outside i see a completely amazing diverse amount of plants growing of shrubs and trees and uh, you know gardens and all kinds of stuff and if i wanted to eat any of that food there's nothing there for me to eat like fruit is not ripe right now even the people that are trying to grow fruit in their gardens where they're taking care of these plants like that's not ready yet um, you would only have carbohydrate it's such a low amount it's such a limited part of the year none of this would be a problem but in a, in a world where we've made ultra processed food very available for people really inexpensive everything has carbohydrate everything has vegetable oil in it it just makes it really really tough um, especially when all this food is just made to be very addictive and hedonic and you know the saying goes you can't eat just one and it's true it, I, I couldn't myself I always thought of myself as a moderator until I realized that I can't moderate myself and I have to be more of an abstainer. So it's again, it's a bummer that we live in that environment, but that's just kind of is what it is. And that's the downfall for most people, unfortunately. We were just walking a trail and there's natural right now, just uh, raspberries, but they're literally like this big and you would have to sit and burn the energy to pick them. First of all, you'd have to sit and pick them and then you'd only get little tiny ones and they're only here for like a week or two. Yep. So it'd be a very short season. We would even be able to eat these tiny berries when you go into the grocery store. They're this big. Yeah. And you can totally just different. grab them and just start eating an entire an entire thing of them without any work or anything. In yeah, so January, in February, in, in April, whatever month you like, it's always there. It's so interesting. So are we turning the protein, the animal protein we eat into sugar, or is it our muscle that's turning into sugar, or is it both? A, well, so your body can get the, the carbohydrate that it needs to run itself. It can get it from breaking down fat. So the word triglyceride, glycerol is in there. So that is a component of carbohydrate that we can use. Um, I believe in somebody who's very well fat adapted. I think that low amount of carbohydrate they didn't need can be more than sufficient from the breakdown of triglycerides or fat energy in the body to give us that glycerol uh, molecule. Um, we can also get it from protein. The breakdown of amino acids can give us a certain amount. But again, when we're talking about the loss of muscle mass, it's not something that I ever see. And I'm looking for it. I'm measuring it. I'm, I'm t checking it on so many people. I'm, I'm like across the board, people that are young, people that are old, people that are men and women, like all kinds of different states. And as long as they're eating this proper way and they're running themselves on fat, whatever carbohydrate they're getting, it's not coming from their muscle mass. It really isn't. My muscle mass... Uh, over years of doing this has not changed by very much. It will definitely fluctuate if it's like winter time and I'm, you know, I'm liking lifting weights a little bit more in the summertime. I like to ride my bike and walk more. So I lift a little bit less and yeah, that might see a few pounds change in my muscle, but it's not that big of a deal. And as soon as I start lifting again, it comes right back. So I, I, it's not something that I ever see that somebody is like literally breaking down muscle protein when they're living in a fat adapted state. I don't see it. That is so interesting because I hear people say that in the carnivore space, if we fast too much or we eat too little, 
that will start losing muscle mass too, but you haven't really seen that in practice. I don't ever see it. I've got, for example, I've got one client um, who uh, several years ago has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. He's been working on his um, his health and he's been able to reduce his weight. Um, he's on far less medications than he used to be. And he does his personal training with somebody else. And his personal trainer um, isn't like the, the, the best resource as far as like understanding some of these processes and how they work. Um, and so when my client decides that he's going to do fasting, you know, intermittent fasting or time restricted eating and just eating like one meal a day he does that a few days a week this trainer really gets after him and said you're going to lose muscle you're going to lose muscle like you're getting he's in his mid-60s like this is not going to be good they do a weigh-in every single saturday they've done it for years and years and years on the same scale his body his muscle mass on this scale it never changes by more than like half a pound or a pound like it's very constant and consistent and like I, again, it's just never something that I see. And I think the time restriction, um, as far as the eating goes, is very interesting because uh, we know that doing that will increase what we call autophagy, which is your body recycling um, things in the body, and in particular, like proteins. And so the example I'll kind of give somebody is like, what if you were building a building and every single day you get a fresh delivery of new building materials and new bricks? And so this delivery is coming in. You can count on it every single day. If you break a brick in the construction process, you don't care. You just chuck it in a pile in the back. It's not a big deal because you've got fresh bricks coming in. Well, what if all of a sudden the delivery stopped and you weren't getting any new building materials? You may have to like you panic a little bit and then think about, oh yeah, I've got that pile of broken stuff in the back. You know, I was just throwing that away. Let me go see if I can be a little bit more resourceful with it. And you might say, okay, well, these two bricks are broken, but if I take them together or cement them together or whatever, now I've got one good new brick and you can use that to build. And your body does that when it's time restricting. And so again, I see a lot of people who are doing time restricted eating. They're nowhere near the amount of protein that even I think they need, but they're not losing muscle. They don't lose muscle. And, and you just think like, what if the body is recycling materials from other proteins that are in the body that it no longer needs. Um, I think it's part of the reason why if you Google in intermittent fasting before and after pictures, you see these after pictures where people don't look like they've been overweight like a day in their life because their skin is like getting reabsorbed and stays taut. It's all just protein that's available to the body. And to some extent, I think your body can look at it and say like, wow, okay, well, we don't need this skin anymore. Let's kind of reabsorb it and let's use it for protein we need for something else. So. I, you know, I, again, maybe that's not the best or most scientific explanation. But again, when I'm looking at this practically, I don't see people in that state losing muscle at all. I don't. This is amazing because I'm in a lot of groups and people will get afraid to push themselves because they'll go, oh, I don't want to lose muscle. So they, they get afraid of of um, intermittent fasting. They get afraid of their macros. There's so much fear. But in reality, as long as we are fat adapted, our body can kind of handle itself and clear things out is what I'm hearing from experience is what you're seeing. That's, I couldn't have said it better. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm seeing. And again, maybe there's better scientific explanations of why that is. I just think that like, if our ancestors were living on the plains and they didn't have those nice rest stations you described at the at the races where every few miles they're getting a nice, you know, a bunch of like goos or gels or sugary drink or whatever. If they were if they were out hunting and they were literally like losing muscle over time or they were getting weaker or you know less strong, that just means it's less likely that they would ever, you know, make a kill, find something to be able to eat. And I would argue that our species wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that ability. Your body um it's it's tough to build muscle. Your body doesn't want to necessarily go through a really inefficient process to break it down. Um, another example I'll give is like if you've got if you've got a pile of wood, you know, a few cords of wood for a winter that you can use in your wood burning stove, you your first thing to burn energy probably wouldn't be well. Let's chop up the sofa and let's chop up the table and let's burn that. It's like you have the firewood. Use the firewood first. It's only when you've depleted your body fat to such a level that then in the fasted state your body would start to break down some of these other things. It's much less efficient, but you've got to be like starving yourself to be able to get there and become very, very emaciated uh, to be able to get there. So yeah, again, it's not something that I ever see when people are doing time-restricted eating. I don't think people need to worry about that at all.
That's amazing. Another thing I'm seeing, like what's ringing in my head so clear is we just went and stayed with family and they were feeding their kids all kinds of carbs, but they thought it was healthy because it was not because it was um, gluten free. So we're giving these kids all these gluten free sugar snacks and the kids are constantly hungry and and they're like, why do these kids need to eat before bed? This is so crazy, but they needed to like constantly eat. And it goes right with this of like the, well, they were running out of fuel. They were running out of kindling and they just need to. So, so some people say the carnivore diet is so expensive, but if you think about the fact that you can just fuel yourself once or twice a day, it really, to me, seems so much more affordable. Uh, it's yeah. so funny you, you mentioned that. I also just spent time with uh, family, with our in-laws in uh, in Colorado. So we took a trip there. There were four toddlers in the house. Um, I, I, I don't want to, you know, judge parents. We don't have kids ourselves. But, like, these kids are, like, upon waking up, like, grabbing Rice Krispie treats. And, like, their day is cookies and crackers and juice boxes. And, like, the, the, the 10-year-old or I'm sorry, the 10 month old toddler uh, was eating uh, pasta for the first time, but the pasta was cooked in butter. And it was so interesting to see this kid pick up pasta and lick the butter off of the pasta and set the pasta down. I, I just wondered like, wow, I wonder if this kid who's been bottle fed his whole life is like finding a good healthy fat and is like really driven to like lick it off of the pasta, but it, it was the same. It was like they'd, they'd be called in from playing in the sandbox to go eat their snack or have a, a you know, another bottle or like these kids have been eating constantly all day. It's such a high percentage of, you know, the time that they got to spend with each other was like consuming food and then all the screens and like you wonder like, what is it like to clean up toilet or uh, um, diapers for these kiddos? Like you wonder if like, yeah, maybe you can have a treat, but let's start with some eggs and some bacon for breakfast. Let's start with like a few bites of a burger patty and get a little bit more protein. And then, yeah, after a, a meal, do you want some fruit? Sure. Like that's a totally different thing than just like, oh, it was a, it was a lot of, <laughs> I was quite, quite astounded. It was a lot of like, not great food all day. Can't be great. And the crazy part is adults are doing the same thing. They just don't recognize it because they're eating like, let's say a keto treat or low fat or so. And it's kind of the same thing. It's, it's a lot of the same fuel. And so they're constantly wondering like, why am I hungry all the time? And then in society, somehow it became the self blame of, well, you just don't have enough willpower to yeah. stop. You know, I was hungry all the time, could never get full. And now we just went to the zoo. We went to the zoo for four hours after the zoo for four hours. I went for a five mile walk, which I know people are going to say sounds so crazy, but it felt so good in the sun, you know, and all I had with me was water. I didn't eat the entire time and I wasn't even hungry. And, yeah. and my kids too, they eat burger patties and eggs and bacon. And I, I'll bring like, if we need a snack, I'll bring some salami and some cheese sticks, you yeah. know, and, and they're doing great and they don't need to snack all the time either. So it's, it's just so, crazy. The fuel difference. Yeah. Yeah. No, I same it, in a way it gave me more respect for parents who aren't living this way. Like I saw, you know, the parents of these toddlers and they don't eat the way that we, they, everything was there. And like, you know, not only do a lot of them have a few pounds to lose and they, they just look tired. And like one night these toddlers mm -hmm. were up the entire night. They were, one of them was throwing up and the people were up and down the stairs and bottles and, you know, boiling these bottles, which was spilling over and people taking showers and replacing sheets. Like I, I got a small, small, very small taste of like what it must be like to be be a parent and like be extremely sleep deprived and very tired and it's like i can see that in myself and recognize yeah i'm, I'm sleep deprived but i still have like really good energy and you know i'm not losing my temper i'm you know very cool headed and we were able to stay pretty much on our diet the whole time by just eating burger patties and some eggs and like to be able to do that um you know witnessing the parents and they were they were exhausted you know like they're very 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 tired and needed to lay down all the time and like Again, I don't understand fully what it's like to be a parent, but it gave me more respect for them to try to parent in that way. Like, I, I would not be able to do that at age 40. I would be a mess. I would be anxious. I would snap at people. I know my mood would suck. My energy would be much lower. To, to have a calm brain and to step back and see problems and be able to deal with them and, you know, be tired, but it doesn't affect your energy during the day. We fight it's about the same, like four or five miles, easy every single day. And yeah, it just wasn't a problem. But yeah, it's, <laughs> it, 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 I would not want to experience parenting not living in this way. I, I, I think that would be a much greater challenge.
I was going to say, you should give yourself more credit because when I was eating even just the vegetables and the keto products, because I've been low carb for like 10 years, um, I was incredibly moody and, and snapping and screaming. And there were times too, where I had so much rage, I would like throw things. <laughs> um, now since going carnivore, it's gotten so much better. And people are like, aren't you going to yell at your kid? And I'm like, I just feel like we just need to let them work it out. <laughs> There's a, it's a lot calmer. It's a lot more. Let's just let it play itself out sometimes. And I know some people are like, you really need to be on them. But it's, you know, it ruins my piece too, to just be a referee all the time. <laughs> so um, just let's before talk this about call, I just, just, I yeah. just want to point this out. Just before the call, you said your older kids are parent you're babysitting the younger kids and you're like yeah it's been a challenge so far today and you calmly walked out of the room and i don't know what you did or said to them maybe you threw a book at them or maybe you just told them to be a little quieter but hasn't been a problem you look totally chill so it must be working i was like could you guys do that screaming upstairs <laughs> with the door <laughs> shut? yeah I, exactly. I, just, uh, totally different. I think if we referee constantly then we just end up refereeing constantly and sometimes i think they have to work it out but that's maybe a bad parenting style i don't know I have four, so yeah. But the the energy has gotten so much better since going carnivore. Before this, I was struggling just to even do laundry. It, it's just it just bogged my the inflammation just bogged my system down so bad. And I look at my husband; he's still pretty standard American diet, and he needs a nap every day at two o'clock. If he's not working, he has to take a nap, and he doesn't even ask. He just goes and lays down, and he disappears because he had to do it. So there was no choice in it. And I just think. You could have so much more sustainable energy through that afternoon hump. I quit caffeine years ago. It's totally fine. The energy's coming from somewhere. I feel so energetic. Like I can't wait for this call to end so I can go for my walk and <laughs> and go have adventures with the kids. And um, yeah, so, so a lot of people are saying that, and we kind of already debunked this based on experience, that you have to lift to maintain your muscle, but you're helping people strength train and stuff like that. And is that to build muscle? Another really, really good question. Um, uh, yes. Um, it's not to not build muscle, but I think a lot of times, honestly, the goal for most people could even be like maintaining their muscle. Um, I think we have this idea that you always have to lift more weights or if your muscle mass is 60 pounds, it should be 61 pounds. Um, and I just, I don't see that with many people that their body just continues to grow and grow and grow more muscle. I think unless you're, you know, really taking in tons of protein or other supplements and you're lifting six days a week, um, you know, without a lot of like chemical enhancements, the body just seems to kind of figure out a good kind of muscle mass to have. Um, there's three kind of major body types that we talk about. And, you know, one is kind of an eye type where they're, you know, maybe a little bit naturally skinnier. Uh, those are the people that tend to do like endurance sports and be really good at those. We've got other people that are kind of more of like a V kind of shape where they add muscle a little bit easier. They might be better at power sports. Um, and then we have like the, the O type. And those are the people that can, you know, get big easily and need to be the most cautious about consuming things like sugar and carbohydrates. And so each of those body types will have different um, kind of propensities to be able to add muscle mass. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that everybody should be adding muscle mass. Muscle mass is very important and strength training is one of the most important things you can do. It's one of my favorite lifestyle things that anybody could do. I don't necessarily give people strength training to say like, oh, you always need to add more muscle. For a lot of us as we're aging, maybe it's just that we're maintaining the muscle that we have and not losing it. Uh, we're keeping our bones strong. We're keeping our connective tissue strong that can prevent against injury and help with our balance. And we all know that you know a lot of a lot of people in their later years take a fall and they don't necessarily recover. So so while I think the resistance training is very, very important, I wouldn't say that the goal is always like, yeah, let's just always constantly build more and more and more and more. And I think people do kind of reach their like kind of natural plateau of like your body's not just making more and more and more muscle unless, you know, you're taking a lot of supplements or doing something really, really unnatural, uh, maybe, you know, different hormones like testosterone to force the body to have more muscle than it really naturally kind of wants to have. Um, you see that also with like natural bodybuilding. If you, you know, are familiar with like um, Robert Sykes, um, Keto Savage, and, and you know, we, we met him at Hack Your Health and you see that, yeah, like he's a bodybuilder and he can get himself very lean, but 
I mean, he's competing bodybuilding at almost no body fat percentage at 158 pounds. Like, it's not a ton of muscle. He's not going to be like the 300 pound beast that you see in in somebody who's you know competing at, at the Olympia and you can use as many drugs as you want or whatever. Like, I think the body just kind of naturally sorts out the amount of muscle mass you should have. So, again, strength training, yes, really important. Let's get as much muscle as we can, but it's not necessarily like always more is better. So, when you're working with people, is your program nutrition and movement and or is it just movement or because usually when you hire a trainer they might give you a couple tips on um nutrition which will probably include carbs <laughs> but it's mostly the movement so what do you do in your practice i do whatever people are open to and allow me to talk to them about uh, for example i've got somebody i've trained for nearly two years uh we do the workouts and from day one i you know, he knows what I do and knows that I'm a nutrition coach and he knows what I do personally. Um, and he's told me that he eats a vegetarian diet and he's not really open to new information. So I could, you know, I could have shut him down and, and, you know, tried to force nutrition on him. He probably would have fired me at some point where I've at the very least been able to work with him for almost two years now. And we've got good rapport. And I know that anytime um, he wants to ask, I'm, I'm here and there's a resource. Um, I would love him to eat a little bit differently. He's in his uh, late thirties and is on a statin and has been for a long time. And I just, I would take a different approach than he does. Um, but that said, like, I can't, you know, force that if he's not open to it. So when I'm in a session with somebody, um, you know, whether we're doing a 30 minute session or an hour session can really change things like, yes, I'm giving you whatever exercises I think is going to be best ones you like ones that will help you hit your goals. I want to show you how to do it properly. So you're not getting hurt. Uh, I want to take you to the proper intensity, you know, whether we're counting reps or watching time, whatever I'm tracking, uh, the weight you're lifting. Like there's so many things that I'm doing for you and with you, but also it's not like I'm just, you know, that's all I'm doing. And just counting to 12 really poorly for somebody like we've got time and you get to know your clients and you have conversations and, some of my clients ask me like, Hey man, I'm having trouble with this. I'm getting brain fog in the afternoon. What should I do? Or like, we'll talk, you know, how was your nutrition this week? Did you feel like you had good energy? What things can we do better? How can we make this easier for you? So, um, pretty much everybody knows what I do. Some people take advantage. Other people don't. Um, but, but yeah, I want to, I, I want to do whatever will help my clients get the, the right results that they want, which again, is part of what led me here to begin with is like giving everybody the standard advice. They needed the fruits and vegetables. They needed whole grains. They needed lean protein. They needed different kinds of fats like canola oil and margarine and things like that to have that advice work for nobody. Then this mm -hmm. is my career. This is all I do. And it's not working for anybody. And all I'm doing is giving you this advice and seeing that you suck at following this advice to then go to this other magical land of doing the exact opposite and it works for friggin' everybody all the time. And that's what I'm paid to do. Like, that's what we're going to do. If you show me something better tomorrow, we're going to do that. But like for now, this seems to work really easily and amazingly for myself and all the people I work with. And so to whatever degree my clients are open to talking about that kind of thing, it, it is great. The more, the better. So do you work with people virtually or is it just in person? I do work with people virtually, which if you would have asked me in March of 2020, if that would have ever worked and been a viable option, I would have said that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That would never work. Um, I have several people that I've trained for literally years since the pandemic. I've never met them in person. We do sessions a few days a week. I One lives in Virginia and she trains for Ironmans. Uh, another one lives in Florida and she found me on some low carb podcast that I was on. And we do virtual sessions where I'm literally you know, giving them extra exercises, watching them through my phone, coaching them through form, and it works extremely well. I have to say, I'm very surprised um, that without, you know, everybody having access to really nice gyms or tons of equipment or whatever, like, you can be very resourceful. You can grab a $30 set of bands from Amazon, hire somebody, a professional who can help show you a few things. I've got tons of people that have hired me for two sessions, three sessions, four sessions, just to kind of get some basics down. And they've been going on their own and they do great. Other people really enjoy the sessions and we feel like family at this point. And we laugh and cry together and all the things and they've hired me for years. So it just kind of depends. But yeah, virtual sessions work uh, weirdly very, very well. I can totally see how you would be family because I've, I've just met you in person one time and I feel like 
I can't wait to see you again. So I, it would be so fun. Anybody who needs a trainer, definitely hire Casey. Is your, do you use like an app and you give people a program or is it really like a virtual Zoom type of thing? Another really great question. Um, we try to be very pragmatic and we try to do whatever is going to help our clients the most. So some people, I'm tracking stuff on my end and I keep records and I write stuff down. Um, and that helps me to know where we are. And if they ask, hey, what was I lifting you know, last year at this time? I can quickly go and see what we were doing. My last client that I just trained literally doesn't care about any of that. He can do the same workout several times a week. He doesn't care. He likes the routine. Um, a client I see tomorrow, if I ever did the exact same workout twice, he would probably fire me. And we've done three sets a week for... 14 years, 15 years at this point. So <laughs> that person needs more variety. Um, some people like to have a plan. And so what I use is a software program that allows me to filter exercises based on equipment that people have. So if somebody has a kettlebell and some barbells or whatever, some dumbbells, I can give them exercises on the software plan um, that fits whatever they can do. And so you know, I'll, I'll sit down, I'll put some thought into what their goals are, what exercises make the most sense, how we can maximize um, for people who don't have a lot of time, how can we get the most done in the least amount of time very effectively, um, what they enjoy, what they don't enjoy. And so, yeah, people can use plans like that with, you know, exercises and descriptions and, again, all stuff that they could do with whatever equipment they have available. And, again, other people don't really care about any of that at all, and I don't have to do any of that. They just want me to show up, take them through a workout, and uh, bounce ideas off each other and be done. So, um, and, Well, that's and, yeah. amazing. This is totally different. I had hired a one-on-one -on -one coach, but it was 100% virtual. It was through an app and the app told me what exercises to do. And the app had videos and the app had a food tracker and the app had a daily checklist. And so I really paid for a one-on-one -on -one coach, but 100% of what I did was in the app. Got it. But it sounds like you are much more hands-on. Uh, yeah, and and that's great. And like, I, I definitely don't want to like poo-poo Anybody? Me either. You know? It was the best body comp recomp I'd ever had. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. But there were exercises need... where the video didn't show me and I would do it and I'm like, I feel nothing or this hurts. And I would watch the video over and over and over again and still be stuck. So it would be nice sometimes to have that person who has experience going, Oop, I know what you have to tweak. Your, your hips are too low. That, yeah, that's a great point. Um... I've been in the industry for so long and the company that we worked for before you would be familiar with, they're, they're based out of Minnesota. It was, I mean, you're, you're in a, a big corporate facility, very high end, and you're in competition with 30 other personal trainers for business. And so it becomes a sales driven kind of a thing. And so many personal trainers come up with programs and meal plans and all these things to try to you know, sign up for my booty blast bonanza program or like whatever to try to make yeah. money. And I, I don't my 30 think day shred. Yeah. 30 day shred. Exactly. The 60 day challenge that we all used to run at this, this club, we would do that every quarter and put people through weight loss contests. And like it, it, it drives a lot of money. It's just, again, I don't want to poo poo people who are doing this. I just, I, I feel I don't, I don't feel genuine offering those kinds of things. You can't go to our website and buy a program. We don't sell them. We sell our time. If you need an hour a month for whatever, that's great. Let's do that. If you need five hours a week, that's great. Let's do that. And we just work with people in whatever way is going to be best for them. I think that if you are highly motivated, uh, the tracking helps you. Um, the video content is really good and you can see what's going on. You've got experience and you know what to do to feel certain things. Like that's one thing, but you are missing that kind of human element of like, I, I, if I'm watching you do a row, I can see whether are your shoulders up and that's going to affect your neck. I, you can give me feedback on if something is giving you pain. There's so many different ways to do a row. You could stand up tall and pull a band towards you, or you could bend over and lift weights you know, from the ground. But the second way, the latter way might put more pressure on your lower back and might cause back pain. All we would need to do is one simple tweak and change the posture to do the same exercise and you'd get the same results without any of the pain. So again, lots of different ways to do it. I just have always preferred getting to know somebody, building rapport, let's watch, let's talk. What are you struggling with? You know, how, how can I be your therapist today if that's the case? Like whatever.
that's just the way that I I work with most people, and I, that that feels good to me. I guess is best I could say. So. So two more questions. Number one, if somebody wanted to just build some strength and uh, you know have more working towards lifelong ability to move, what kinds of tools could they have at home? I know you said bands, but like what other tools at home would be good for that? Because if we're looking at too, just adding time to our day, you add a whole hour driving back and forth to the gym. But if you could just have some things at home that you could work on, what would those be? Great question. The, I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying the more tools you have, the better, the easier it's going to be. Some people, for no other reason than it gets them re-excited about workouts, will spend a bunch of money on a new contraption or a new you know, tool for fitness. Fine. Like if you have it, if you've got the means, the more stuff you have, the better it's going to be. If you're asking me what is necessary, like the, the minimal effective dosage, again, a $30 set of bands on Amazon uh, with varying thicknesses, like you can get a set of four different bands, some are really, really thick and very difficult to pull, some are really thin and really easy. Uh, you could also get attachments like handles that you could use to pull on them. You can get a mount where you can attach it high or low on a door frame or something you'd take to the park. That's seriously the, the lowest um, barrier to entry you could get great results for the rest of your life very effectively and easily and not spend more than like 40 50 bucks for all of that that i'm describing i focus on uh what i call the big six which is six different lifts in the upper body and lower body that lift multiple joints and are a really good balance of pushing exercises and pulling exercises and pretty much any workout that i do with somebody that's a total body workout we're going to do pretty much a, one variation of any of those six exercises in every workout some type of a, a chest press a row a shoulder press a pull down and then the lower body something that's like a squat and maybe something that's like a dead deadlift so three different pushing exercises three different pulling exercises multiple joints all the biggest muscle groups are in the middle part of your body which is where that works um, if you did that one time in a week for 20 to 30 minutes that to me is the minimal effective dosage of what could be really 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 effective for you 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 could do more than that but that is, again, minimal effective dosage. When I tell people, most people are really surprised. Like, I don't do more than 20 or 30 minutes of strength training a week. Now, the strength training I do, it sucks. It's really intense and it's difficult. But I don't spend hours and hours at the gym. I don't like to drive to a gym and spend an hour there. People think trainers like to work out. Like, no, we don't. Working out <laughs> sucks. I like to paddleboard and walk and play hockey and be on my yes. bike. Yes. All the fun stuff, you know what I mean? I don't want to yes. work out. It's terrible. So I just want to do the minimum effective stuff, get that out of the way, and then go spend time doing the stuff that I really, really love. So, uh, yeah, again, Ooh, I love hire that. a professional, learn a few basic things. Whether you continue with the trainer or not, it doesn't matter. But once you learn it, you have the equipment, you can do this for the rest of your life. I don't train my 85-year-olds very different than I train my 15-year-olds. There's definitely individual things to consider and maybe some different exercises but the, the plan is not like vastly drastically different it's very similar so you are making this so much less intimidating because even you know i've been lifting for 20 years and i still get intimidated because i'm seeing these programs where like I did with that trainer where I'm doing these different exercises and then every four weeks it switches and then you have push days and back to, I don't remember what they're called days. And so I, now I'm thinking now that I don't have this trainer, is it even worth it to go do my push ups, squats, sit ups and pull ups? It is. That's still good functional lifting. It doesn't have to be that complicated. It sounds yeah. like. I yeah I agree I did the same thing I was trained in that same way where yes there's very specific rep ranges and all these different exercises and if you again like a hockey player okay you play hockey now in the gym you're going to do all of this stuff that looks like hockey so let's jump back and forth on a hardwood and then maybe you're swinging a stick like you're going to clobber somebody with your hockey stick or whatever you're going to do that looks like hockey as it turns out none of that is hockey hockey is played on ice with five people on each team 
team and a goalie and you've got your buddies who consistently talk smack at you and it's not the same context you can't just go to a gym and do hockey stuff hockey stuff is hockey stuff use the gym to be really strong do your squats do your rows uh do your chat whatever exercises you have do them and be really intense with them move slowly and with control so you're never getting hurt and to keep that constant then take yourself to where you're really challenging yourself and get out of there that's all you need then you you again there's no risk of injury you're not running around throwing stuff all these sexy looking crazy exercises and stability balls and bosus and all this crap like it's it's not necessary and for a lot of people can be really detrimental and cause harm can hurt people so yeah it's so much easier than people make it it's just a it's just like the food industry it's just we want to try to make it loud and noisy so people spend a lot of money and think it's really complicated that brings me to i have a friend who does slow burn so it kind of sounds like she does a lot like what you do she does like 30 minutes twice a week and it's really intense and it's only maybe like two or three reps of each thing but she says that we shouldn't be lifting every single day that'll cause inflammation and and issues or something is that true or can yeah, if, if we want to lift an hour a day can we do that I love the question. Yes, both of those can be true. If she's it, when it sounds like she is doing the true and proper way to do slow burn, um, that's the style that I really like and really change my thinking on a lot of this stuff. Taking a weight, moving it very slowly, however slow somebody goes. Some people have different like preferred tempo ranges or whatever, but the goal is to take an exercise to a level of intensity that's maybe you're shaky, maybe you're feeling anxious or you want to speed up or like you want to get this lift done, but you just let it burn and you set it down. That type of exercise cannot, should not be done every single day because of the nature of the intensity. So yeah, twice a week is actually quite a bit for somebody who's an experienced lifter. I hear stories all the time of people doing that style of training for years, and they do like once every other week or once every third week. Because like, if you look at your hand, you might find like a little place that you nicked or cut, and it might have been like a week or two ago, but it's still like red and inflamed. You mentioned that inflammation. Think about tearing up your muscles, creating so much inflammation. That's not just going to heal itself in 24 hours. You need to rest and give it time. So if she's doing slow burn in that proper way, two times, 30 minutes, that's like max, max, max. That might be for like a beginner who's just getting started. If you are lifting not quite as intense and you like the gym and you want to go in six or seven days a week, then yeah, you can do that too. Just don't make it as intense. Split things up. Like you mentioned, like lower body days or push and pull days or, you know, one day back and biceps and shoulders and triceps or whatever. Then yes, you can do that and you can go every day. And that's if that's where you want to spend your time, go ahead and do that. That's great. Just the intensity can't be as high. So you just have to consider what your goals are and what you enjoy doing. This has been so amazing. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, where can people find you? I know we can find you Boundless Body Radio. How, where do people find you? Uh, well, first of all, Adrian, you are an amazing host. Um, these are some of the questions I've never really gotten to answer. So you do a great job asking the questions. And it's um, it's been such a joy to be here and, and, and to get to know you in person and host you on our show as well. has been um, really great, very special. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, the easiest place to find us is our website. Our website is myboundlessbody.com. The first thing anybody's going to be able to see is a book now button where anybody in the country or around the world can book a complimentary. 30 minute session, you know, people that want to talk about their goals or want to talk about nutrition or their fitness plan. They want me to help them with some of that stuff. That's fine. Um, I say it on my podcast all the time, even if it's just for somebody to like reach out, introduce themselves, say hello, to do that. Like I would love to meet more people out there and just get to know some people and, um, you know, help people feel like they're in a community that is, so that's where you can do that is on the website. You'll also find the, the podcast there. We do three episodes a week and sometimes four. Um, so there can be quite a bit of content there. If somebody's interested in a certain topic, they can always like message me through the website and ask if I've got a certain recommendation for um, uh, an episode or something. And yeah, there's a lot of different resources um, there all for free. So people can go check that out. And again, it's just the website, which is myboundlessbody.com. They'll find all our socials and YouTube and all that other stuff there as well. Great. Well, thank you so much again. And everybody, thank you for tuning in today. We hope you like it. If you do, please like, subscribe, and share. Bye.